I will simply say that this industry and the industries allied to it, the bioeconomy industries, have a tremendous amount of depth of talent that's globally dispersed. And you have to necessarily count on being able to tap into those global networks. And they exist everywhere, as you heard from Doug in Southeast Asia, in, in, in the Far East, in Europe. Uh, we've worked everywhere, all over the world, as a group that specializes in the commercialization of innovations. And we've tapped into the expertise that resides in all of these areas for the benefit of bringing those innovations to life. You know the old GE line, we bring good things to life. Well, entrepreneurs never get into the business, and Masood talked about this earlier, they never get into the business of wa wanting to do this for, to make money, except for the app people in Silicon Valley, right? This is about us, just a small commercial. We specialize in commercialization accelerator programs that are virtual and not physically located in any particular location, which means we're agnostic, which means we're going to be more neutral about your assets and your issues and your drivers. We do have a, a, something I'm very proud of, the Ag Innovation Showcase. Uh, it's a long-standing nine-year event. Doug has been to that as well. It's in St. Louis once a year. It's not about St. Louis. It's not about Missouri. It's about the world of innovation in ag. We also have a smaller roving group called GAIN, the Global Ag Innovation Network, where we go into specific areas around the country to unearth opportunities, talent, money, etc. And we bring other people to this from elsewhere. So we've done it in North Carolina. We've done it in, 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 in Northern California, where they suddenly woke up to the fact that there was a world beyond apps in food. Um, and as a consequence, we actually got some very interesting deals that were done with companies that didn't exist in the Bay Area, but existed outside the Bay Area, including in the Northwest, but also in the Southwest. Uh, we, we do a blog that's sort of general interest, also very specific in technologies, and I'll come to that in a second, what technologies we cover. And we're cultivating and growing a network constantly, an intelligence-based network, which is who is doing what and to whom, where do they exist, what are their views, who are they working with, how are they connected to innovations from research institutions, from universities, from entrepreneurial groups around the world, where can we best connect them with others that they would never have had the opportunity to, to work with otherwise. And we become a sort of hub with many spokes. Feed, fuel, and heal describes us perfectly. We have three major practice areas. Food and ag, we are the principal commercialization partner for the USDA in all their commercialization of SBIR. How many people here know what SBIR is? Excellent. If I did this in California, there'd be two hands up. That's to show you how, how crazy things can get. Very good, keep it up. SBIR is the only program available for emerging research focused on for-profit companies. Not on researchers, not on groups of scientists working in a lab tirelessly, but sometimes removed from the issues of the market, but for-profit companies that have to live and die by decisions they make every day in the marketplace. We need more wonderful ideas that come forward for the SBIR competition in the USDA, frankly. We'll talk about it in a second. So we understand that for entrepreneurs, one size does not fail. They come in with their own assets, with their own mindsets, with their own issues, with their own histories, with their own aspirations and dreams. This is the land of Edison, and we ought to be able to celebrate that. The diversity, and the not just gender diversity, or racial diversity, but diversity in terms of our own mindsets, and our own histories and backgrounds is such that we need to be able to recognize that each entrepreneur is different. Not just in terms of stage, but in terms of prospect and promise and the opportunities that they, that, that they may or may not take. So what we come up with is a network-centric, as we call it, approach to entrepreneurial education, entrepreneurial knowledge sharing and know-how and connections and this is the kind of, it's a very simple diagram, but it essentially illustrates how, as a hub organization, we can be a connector, but also a major, uh, what I should call a provoker, a provocateur, 
of the kinds of interactions that can be had between entrepreneurs, industry folks, governments, universities, and a whole range of other things. And so one sets their own backgrounds, their own aspirations. There has to be a core of discipline associated with it, of course, and that's what we come up with. It's a philosophy and a methodology. But beyond that, it is a way of operating that's going to serve them well as they move out into full commercialization. So it is a commercialization accelerator, a virtual one, because, and I'll show you that in a second here, our clients are throughout the sciences. The events that we do, there are two specific sets of events around agriculture, because as, uh, as I was saying to Marie earlier, we work on technologies that feed, fuel, and heal the world. If there is the promise of a bioscience future in LA's future, it is the fact that this is a gigantic metropolis with all of the characteristics that you would expect to have from a metropolis of its size. And I want to tell you folks, if you're in the sciences, you have a necessary obligation to be simple and to effectively translate for everyone because this is a very dangerous moment not because of the political issues that are swirling around the country, but because of the specific issues that nominate our body politic and the dialogue around the sciences. Fact is an, an option right now, and that is not good. And so if you are trying to bridge the gap of understanding, of being able to come up with things that can actually cure disease, or feed the world, or heal the world, or otherwise get you know, human life to the point of it being noble and wonderful and worth embracing and worth living for, then you really need to look at how you, how you express what you say and not be completely alienated from what is occurring around the country because our people need to understand this stuff. They are very often otherwise at the receiving end of innovation as opposed to being participants in the glory of innovation in a country. The U.S. is uniquely blessed in the number of different strands that we have, but it's by no means unique anymore. And so any innovator has got to consider how he or she is able to navigate those shoals and be aware of them. Every single time you come up with something, you've got to be aware of the global implications of what you do because of the markets you can serve, the people you can connect with, the kind of resources you can raise, and the talent you can hire. And that is just part of what we have to do. I so, started my career in Los Angeles um, in the, and I hate to say this because of what age me, the late 80s, uh, after being an entrepreneur for, for almost nine years, I started off as a, to, to run a trade association and, and, and a, a, of, of CEOs in the defense and electronics industry. So Peter Drucker, who lived here, by the way, and taught here, as you know, at Claremont, was one of those people in that, in that group. Mal Curry, who was CEO of Hughes at the time, which has now morphed considerably. Uh, a number of other great folks in Boeing and Northrop and, and Lockheed were part of this little group of CEOs, and I managed that group for a few years. It's called the President's Roundtable. We worked on and through the defense downsizing that started in California at the beginning of the 90s. And if you didn't know this already, well before the rise and the extreme attention paid to Silicon Valley, this state was a cauldron of technology and aerospace was the driving force behind that cauldron of technology and when aerospace declined as it did at the end of the first gulf war in the early 90s uh, there was a considerable amount of pain specifically felt in los angeles because it was ground zero for the aerospace industry i have to simply say this city and this area has gone through four or five reinventions since the Second World War. And what has stayed on is some very fundamental building blocks of any kind of economy that's technology-based. Right? You've got visualization and simulation, you've got propulsion, you've got engineering technologies, you've got materials, all of which, by the way, in one way or the other, will be pertinent even to the biosciences industry. Uh, the great strength of the region is not that it has all of these industries, but that it is able to stitch together a future that involves all of them in a very significant way. And I think it's going to be up to us as a community to be able to continue to move that forward. But I also have to say, foreign investment, because of the history of foreign investment in Los Angeles as a pioneering place, 
if you spot out opportunities here for investors, if you spot out opportunities here, you have the, the, re, the real chance to make a difference. Because you know what? You don't want to go to, as Wayne Gretzky said, you don't want to go to where the puck is. You want to go to where the puck will be. And where it will be is not where San Francisco or Boston are right now. It will be, whether you call it a vision of the future or the city of dreams, whatever you want to call it, Los Angeles is that kind of place. One thing that every one of you uh, it needs to recognize. Is this just an empty passion? Or do you have a real need, not just to transform because of your passion, but to build a sustainable business? Because sustainability is the key to any entrepreneurial venture that needs to be able to look at itself as transforming human life and human prosperity. And the key issue that you will necessarily wrestle with as you're building your entrepreneurial venture, as you're going on your entrepreneurial journey, is what I would call the complex of the five W's. The why, the what, the when, the where, and, by the way, why again? Which you have to keep asking yourself over and over and over again. And let me go through that. So why? Why are you doing this? What is it that drives you? Is it a personal drive or is it some kind of intellectual curiosity that's driving you to build this particular innovation in this particular time, in this particular place? Uh, as you start your entrepreneurial journey and as you continue it, and remember something, it's never going to stop, right? Never going to stop. You go from this to something else, you may stay with this all your life, you may in fact find a different pathway, but what you've learned will be built upon. I can guarantee you that because we're human and that's what we do. We are all the sum total of so many different experiences and assets and mindsets and histories that it is necessary for us to remember that we can do other things as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.